Eric Kurlander. Dr. Kurlander. How's it going? Good. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. This is uh, D. Simon and Harrison here calling you. Uh, thanks, thanks for being on the show this morning. Oh, thank you for having me. So um, the Nazis and the occult are uh, popular themes in movies, definitely in uh, pop culture like Raise the Lost Ark or Hellboy, for example. But is this based in reality or is this more of a sens- sensationalized and exaggerated account? I guess my question is to what degree did the belief in occult philosophies influence the creators of the Third Reich? Well, that was my question when I started the research uh, eight or nine years ago is, you know, what, what real um, evidence is there for these massive pop cultural, um, you know, kind of indus- this industry, right? Comic book, yeah. film, popular crypto history. And I started out pretty skeptical, even though I'm fascinated by that. And I read Captain America as a kid and um, liked the Hellboy movies. Um, I, I was, I was, you know, like many, any academic, somewhat skeptical. I knew a, a bits and pieces of things. Like everyone who mm-hmm. studies the Third Reich knows that Himmler had some odd beliefs on religion and race, and that um, has supposedly had his own astrologer. Um, and you, you should know if you're a German historian that the Thule Society, the Thule Gesellschaft mm-hmm. in German, um, was based on a kind of occult mythological concept of a lost Aryan civilization. And that, of course, produced the Nazi party. Um, hey, are you talking about uh, Ariosophy? Ariosophy is, is actually the, the occult doctrine that influenced the Thule Society most, but I didn't know that before I started my research. I just knew that the Thule Society was at least a, a kind of post-occult society. Um, what I actually found uh, is that many of the things that float around in pop culture have a kernel of truth in them. I mean, we could go through, you know, there's dozens of stories in this book. And even where they don't, so even where there's a clear disconnect between reality and, and you know, the fantasy that we see um, everywhere around us, there are actually more interesting stories, right? Stranger <laughs> than fiction that haven't been told. Yeah, that, that's, right? that's the one thing that, uh, that, that I find interesting about your book is you do talk about things like, like Hitler's world ice theory. Right. Uh, how exactly did that fit into uh, Hitler's philosophy? So World Ice Theory is really interesting because it's a quintessential, what I call, and what Germans at the time called, a border science, a Grenzwissenschaft. The border sciences were sciences, it was a positive term, as opposed to, let's say, pseudoscience, right, which is Mm -hmm. dismissive. Border science was a science often coming out of occultism, though they wouldn't use that term at the time, which supposedly had insights into the world, the universe, the cosmos, um, the you know the the area below the Earth's crust. That the whole Earth theory fits into that as well, right? Excuse me. Hollow Earth theory. Hollow Earth theory fits into that as well. Right, and so by the way, this is this is a perfect example. So Hollow Earth theory was not that prominent in the Third Reich. There are a few tangential figures who seem to have read theories on Hollow Earth, and there were um, theosophists and anthroposophists who believed in it, and then, so I guess, secondhand, some Nazis were interested. But compared to World Ice Theory, which is institutionalized in the Third Reich, there's almost no evidence that Hollow Earth Theory had an influence. So there's an example where we hear about Hollow Earth all the time, but it's really World Ice Theory, if you want to talk about a border science, that many Nazi leaders, including Hitler and Himmler, embraced. And it was based on a dream, a fantasy, by a non-scientist, a guy named Hans Horbinger, an Austrian, who woke up and had this dream, and I guess he was in a sweat, and he, he had images of all these ice moons and ice planets orbiting around the Earth and smashing into each other and floods, and he said, you know what, the reason that you know the great civilizations of, the, of prehistory were destroyed is because these ice moons that were rotating around the Earth must have crashed into the earth, created ice ages and floods, destroyed all these great civilizations. And, you know, all we, and we world ice theorists can go back and now reconstruct the earth's history and the history of the cosmos by recognizing everything was once made of ice. That was more or less his theory. Well, so that makes sense. But then where did, where did the white supermen come from? 
Well, so the way this works, it's kind of there's these affinities between these different um, clusters of ideas, which is why I, I use this term of supernatural imaginary. Mm. You know, everyone who writes a book, whether it's history or literature or psychology, they want to come up with one overarching idea, right? Like um, uh, Hitler's an atheist. Hitler's a Christian. Um, uh, the the one, you know, the conservatives think like this, liberals think like, like that. What I found in researching this is that there's no one idea or doctrine, like Ariosophy, which Nicholas Goodrich Clark had wrote a whole book on. Yes, it doesn't explain the Third Reich exclusively because it was just one of dozens of doctrines and pagan religions that fit into the supernatural imaginary. And the way you start to see its influence is when you look at affinities between, as you just suggested, world ice theory, which is ostensibly a kind of science, right, that's explaining natural history. The creation and story. These theories, these theories like um, Ariosophy, which is an occult doctrine, but also believes in a lost Aryan civilization and, and a kind of Nordic utopia around Iceland, which they call the Thule, which we might call Atlantis. And you start to say, oh, wait, there's affinities there. And frost giants would have survived in both. And Thor could have been the god in both of those scenarios, right? And mm -hmm. there's a flood which destroys the civilization, so these godmen, these Aryans, have to flee to somewhere really high. Oh, wait, Tibet, right? Oh, okay. The Himalayas, yeah, where yeah. they preserve their religion. And now we get into this Indo-Aryan belief behind Nazism. How can these people who are so Germanic in, in their fetishization of the North also be pro-Indo-Aryan, Tibet? Well, that's it. And world ice theory and Ariosophy in that way are connected, even though they seem independent. Well, it seems almost convenient. Does that make sense? But it does, but it also seems kind of convenient for Hitler to say, yeah, you know, we practice or, you know, we, we accept Shintoism in Japan or Hinduism in Tibet in the Himalayas. Is it so that they can justify the fact that they're allies with this nation? So the argument I make about almost all of these doctrines is there's always an element of, of instrumentalization or pragmatism, and there's always an element of authenticity. It depends on the Nazi, it depends on the doctrine, it depends on the context. There was, there's so much evidence that all the leading Nazis, not just Himmler and Hess, but Dare, um, uh, Rosenberg, Hitler, believed that in, in vaguely in this Indo-Aryan theory that there was this great race that spread out and founded all the great civilizations, including in the, in the Indus Valley, Persia, and Japan, that it wasn't just instrumentalization. They really believed in that, and they assumed that the samurai class and the Brahmins were the ones who were the most Aryan, right, who had intermingled with these ancient prehistorical supermen. And so, you know, Himmler was writing forwards to books on the samurai in German, talking about how if only the German soldier and SS could take on these samurai values of the, and, and, and the great kind of principles of Shinto religion, as opposed to this weak, Judaified Christianity, mm. we would be great warriors too, right? <clears throat> Hitler was talking about how fascinated he was by Shinto and Buddhism and how those were great religions, not, not religions of terror, like Judaism and, and Christianity, which try to keep you down and, and level everything. So this all fits together in their cosmology and the supernatural imaginary. It's not like, you know, they all believed in, in each of these doctrines equally, but they all have affinities with each other. I, I read that Himmler tried to get world ice theory taught instead of Darwinian evolution in German universities. So, so I mean, the Germans were, were very educated. But how could they right. how could they follow this? I mean, did most did the average German believe in the world ice theory? Right. So, you know, Germany and Austria are a country of 75, 80 million once by the time they're united in 38. You count Bohemia and ethnic Germans elsewhere, well over 80 million. I would argue that, you know, at least half of those people, certainly the very well educated, the cosmopolitan and also people who are very traditional Christian in some rural areas we're not trafficking in these ideas. The Nazis never got more than 35 or 40% of the vote in any election. And they didn't need everyone to believe in it. They needed to tap into that zeitgeist for those people who had lost their kind of 
intellectual and ideological moorings, right? Was it kind of middle class, wasn't there, wasn't there, lower middle class people um, in the small towns, uh, a lot of the large cities who mm-hmm. were already interested in these supernatural ideas, who kind of had rejected traditional Christianity and who didn't trust science and liberalism and materialism and Marxism. You know, for them, that wasn't going to satisfy them spiritually or politically. And for them, these ideas, which Nazism picked up on and appealed to, were perfect. So, yes, there's a lot of mainstream scientists. Wasn't there? Einstein, they're all making fun of world ice theory, but Himmler doesn't care. Himmler's argument is they're these Jewish scientists who are all materialists would like to destroy our belief in the, in the beyond and in, you know, in, in something greater than ourselves and, and relativity is about confusing us. That's why we need world ice theory because it's a more authentic Germanic science. Right. Didn't they publish a, a book called the SS family that was kind of a, a, a guidebook for SS officers to, you know, celebrate, incorporate paganism into their, the way they celebrated birthdays and, and different things like that. The SS Ananerba, which is Himmler's research institute, publishes mm-hmm. hundreds of books and articles and funds hundreds of expeditions. I mean, to, to give you another area where there's affinity, so let's get to religion here, right? So mm-hmm. we talk about world ice theory, of border science, talk about anthroposophy, which is an occult doctrine. In terms of religion... Himmler was sponsoring, and he's just one of many, a guy named Otto Rahn. Ah. Otto Rahn was a, a philo- young philologist who we now, many of us would call the real Indiana Jones, philologist, archaeologist, who had been researching the Grail in southern France mm-hmm. with a bunch of French occultists and, and Freemasons and you know Dan Brown types. And his theory was, which many occultists and kind of paganists believe, is that the grail, whether it was a real thing or a symbolic thing, which is what he was researching, was, was idolized or representative of an Ur-Aryan religion that had been practiced in the East, in Tibet and Persia, after the flood, and then brought back in the Middle Ages via Persia and the Middle East, right, around the time of Christianity, a kind of Gnostic paganism that was brought back to Europe. And the reason the Catholic Church wanted to eliminate it, right, the Inquisition, is because the Jews saw it as threatening because it was an Ur-Aryan religion, which they called witchcraft, right, and, and paganism and Satanism, but for the Germans was the authentic religion and also, you know, the rural French, because the Franks were, the French were also Germanic, right? And the Holy Grail was at the center of that religion. And so Ron had theorized that there was a Luciferian religion where Lucifer is the god of light that goes back to this Ur-Aryan cataclysmic, you know, prehistory, and it had come back to Europe, and the Germans and and pagan people practiced it, but the Catholic Church, which is, of course, manipulated and run by Jews, wanted to destroy it. Himmler believed this. Dare believed this. Many Nazis believed it. And, and they funded this these expeditions. This also fits in with world ice theory and Ariosophy, even though those are completely independent doctrines, and someone who believed in one may not have even heard of the other. You see how they all have the same premises, right? Um, so you've done a lot of research on on Adoran. Are there anything to the rumors that Adoran was actually gay? There's quite a bit. I mean, given mm-hmm. the times that he was penalized or demoted after supposedly being seen in a bar doing something untoward. I mean, there were a lot of alcoholics in the yeah. SS, and yes, if you were too, if you were drunk publicly, um, you could be punished in some way. But the fact that that happened in multiple times, that it often was preceded by some heart to heart with Himmler, um, suggests that yes, he was combating, you know, publicly the image of being gay. Um, and that's why his suicide, which some people have conspiracy theories about may well have been him recognizing because he had just basically gotten married. Um, or he, he had agreed with Himmler to get married and then called it off. It looks like he was, you know, not able to be open about his sexuality and rather than continue to get assigned to concentration camps to rehabilitate himself, right, he just, he, he walked out into the, 
Yeah, I, I mean, I, I didn't spend a lot of time on Otto Rahm's personal life, but from the stuff I read, it, it does seem... Um, importantly, he was rehabilitated by Himmler a year or two later, and his books kept getting published. So whatever was going on, uh, it wasn't enough to undermine his credibility as a scholar. So, so uh, my question is about uh, some of the other leading Nazis, like Eichmann or, um, or Mengele. Like, did they dismiss some of these like Himmler's expeditions as just folly? Because, I mean, you know, Hitler or Himmler even had the SS Witches Division. Like, what did these guys think of that, like other leading Nazis? So the great question for the Witches Division was actually under Heydrich. Oh. So if I had to pick the most skeptical Nazis, I would pick Heydrich and his subordinate, Eichmann. Eichmann was a protege of Heydrich, not Himmler. Um, kind of a technocrat who would just do whatever he was asked. What's interesting, and, and there's revisionist work that I've been saying he's actually very ideological and had crazy views about Jews also. He wasn't just some banal bureaucrat. But Heydrich, who was very opposed to sectarianism of any kind, Heydrich just believed that if you're not a devout Nazi, you're dangerous. So whether you were a Jehovah's Witness or a devout Catholic or an astrologer, if you couldn't show that you were completely into Nazism first, he saw you as a threat. So one reason that Heydrich's always out to get occultists, which he doesn't do a good job of because he gets no support from above or from his colleagues, um, is because of this anti-sectarianism. And some historians have confused that with a blanket disdain for occultism. And as I show in the book, they just want people to be loyal to Hitler. So you get this weird thing where leading anthroposophists who have all these crazy occult ideas like this guy Erhard Bartsch is constantly being wined and dined and hired by Daré and Rosenberg and Himmler and Ohlendorf. And it, what brings him down, which Ohlendorf, a leading SS man, tells him, stop doing this, is when he tells anyone he meets, if you really want to understand uh, biodynamic agriculture and all the cosmic things I'm teaching you, you've got to become an anthroposophist. You've got to accept Rudolf Steiner as your savior, not Hitler, basically. That's what gets them in trouble. It's not the doctrine. So to come back to this idea of are there other Nazis, or, you know, Heydrich and, and Eichmann, the witches division, Himmler was interested in the history of the Inquisition. Why? Coming back to the Otto Rahn thing, you see all these things are linked. Mm -hmm. He believed that the Catholic Church was going after witches as a cover for eliminating German culture and religion by calling it witchcraft. And the second reason, is, which is why Heydrich liked doing it, because he didn't do it in the, under the aegis of the SS. He did it under the aegis of the SD, the security service that Heydrich ran, is it was opposition research. So their idea is if we understand why and how the Catholics and Jews went after us and tried to exterminate us, in the medieval and early modern period, we'll understand better what they're trying to do to us now, the churches and the Jews and the Bolsheviks, and then we can respond in kind. Now, that's bizarre as heck, but <laughs> that was the justification along with the research itself for the witches' division. Now, th th there have been a number of books about this in the past, but a lot of them have been you know, fairly sketchy, uh, beginning with Morning of the, Morning of the Magicians in the 60s. And then, uh, yeah, there were a couple of World War II vets from America who wrote books like Trevor Ravenscroft about the spirit of destiny. The only one I found that's like semi, you know, re reliable was uh, Peter Lavenda's Unholy Alliance. He, he strad I actually will cite him occasionally. He straddles the two genres. He straddles like academic history and mm -hmm. what I call crypto history. Yeah. Lavenda, almost half of his sources and claims are not corroborated by German archival sources or eyewitnesses. And clearly he has an ax to grind and that's borderline in some ways a cultist himself. On the other hand, he does come up with a lot of um, arguments based on evidence that I find very plausible. So the way I dealt with that is if it was a book like Lavenda, I would, I would cite it you know, um, selectively to acknowledge his arguments where I thought they were legitimate, but not rely on him for primary evidence. Um, most of the other books are completely fabricated. So while we know they looked for the Holy Grail, we have plenty of archival evidence for that. And he had all these other mystics talking about the Grail. I found almost no evidence, at least among the usual suspects, of them thinking that the Spear of Destiny was a mystical object 
that would somehow win the war for them, like, you know, the Ark of the Covenant. It's true that some of them were interested in it, that Hitler did probably visit it. You know, he grew up Catholic in, 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 near Vienna. I'm sure he was interested in it. But, again, it's like the hollow earth theory. When you have all these things that really were important, why are we focusing on something for which there's no concrete evidence that it had any central importance, right? And that's why I so no, the fear of destiny for you know. So no flying saucers at the secret polar base is what you're saying. <laughs> well, no, actually, with flying saucers, I did find some evidence. So here's the mm-hmm. flying saucer thing. And I do have a chapter that looks at, at miracle weapons. Um, they hired a guy named Victor Schauberger, who was an Austro, an amateur Austrian scientist who looked at water dynamics. And some of the stuff he did actually was real science. And based on that, he came up with certain theories about anti-gravity and, and, and hidden forces in the universe, which are obviously very similar to what occultists claim. Um, some major Nazi leaders and industrialists already in 34 are like, Hitler, you should meet with this guy. You know, he's already met with Mussolini, who I, who I guess thought he was crazy and didn't pursue it. Um, and so he's like, Hitler, you should meet with him. Because at the time, Austria was in between the two fascist powers. and He didn't want to lose out, right? So Hitler met with him. Hitler was annoyed. So it would, we have the transcripts. Hitler was annoyed that he wouldn't tell any of his secrets to him. So every time Hitler said, so how could you do anti-gravity or what is this thing? He'd say, oh, that's patented. You know, if you hire me and give me a lab, I can tell you, you know, more or less. Um, Hitler's kind of sober chancellery, chancellery buddy, Lammers, in his notes, is like, this guy's clearly a charlatan. I can't believe the Fuhrer would really trust him. I hope the Fuhrer doesn't. And then, you know, some snarky aside, of course, Kaiser Wilhelm brought in a cultist too. God knows what Hitler's going to do, but he probably won't buy into this guy, right? Within a few years, he's being hired nope. all over Germany to come up with new technologies, none of which work. And then when the war breaks out, Hitler approves him being hired to work on rocket technology and new weapons. Again, nothing he's done has ever been patented to produce any kind of weaponization, you know. And he actually is forced, because Schellberg is not really a Nazi, he's forced by the SS to use slave laborers to experiment with all these anti-gravity things, including something that, that crypto historians call the bell. It's this mythical bell that might have created anti-gravity or harnessed anti-gravity energies and may have been able to levitate and had a very high amount of radiation, which is why lots of prisoners supposedly died. I do have evidence that that thing may have existed, and certainly that Schauberger was experimenting with bizarre stuff. My conclusion is none of it was actually we- you know, weaponized or, or usable. It was all based on fantastical magical thinking and desperation, but he was used by the Third Reich. That we know. Wow. What I don't believe is that in Operation Paperclip, they actually you know, found his bell and put it in Area 51. And by the way, that's the corollary to all of this. Is America has its own supernatural imaginary, <laughs> right, with its own contents, which are just as dangerous in some ways. But, um, you know, that we're talking, focusing on the ones in Germany in the 20s and 30s. Hmm. That's interesting. So a uh, couple questions. I know you got to get going. Um, what did Hitler think of, like, other occult movements like uh, the Golden Dawn or Aleister Crowley. So he didn't think about the Golden Dawn or Aleister Crowley. And in fact, I have a few comments in the book that the big difference between Austro-German occultism and British or French, as far as I can tell, I'm not a, a British or French historian, but I've read secondary works, is there was not a few differences. One, it was rarely politicized or publicized, right? So occultism there is something that these interesting figures did and usually in a kind of commune or in their mansion Mm. often as a way to kind of attract women or it was very feminized in some cases you know spirituality be some guru who had a bunch of women who would you know supposedly get in touch with with spirits that's also true in america um it was also not racialized so as bad as crowley was and yes okay he was kind of a satanist there's no evidence that he really believed in kind of resuscitating some pure Nordic race. He seemed much yeah. more interested in finding different ladies to uh, bring to his you know, rituals. And he actually, I think he worked as a spy for the British 
during the war. So I guess he was pro-democracy, right? Mm. In the Third Reich and in Germany, many of the people who were also interested in, let's say, the order of, order of the new Templ- uh, Templars, that was a, what Crowley belonged to, were like Lance von Liebenfeld's progenitors of Ariosophy. They, want, they created political parties and, and occult groups whose mission it was to get rid of Jews, destroy Bolshevism, and resuscitate this great race. They were less interested in, in finding you know, young women to uh, seduce than they were in meeting at castles and, and um, beer halls and plotting you know, the restoration of Germany and the destruction of Judah. So, so it's just the same ideas, but, but they get deployed far differently. Hmm. And therefore, there's not a lot of connection because Crowley had a different agenda than, Lieben, than Lance von Liebenfels, right? Yeah, it's interesting. I was just wondering how they, uh, I guess, how they, they they considered that version of occultism. Um, okay, final question here before you got to go. Do you think Hitler's suicide, which happened on the night of the 30th, May 1st, which is also Valpurgis knocked, is that more than a coincidence or is that just simply a coincidence that people are kind of extrapolating in the future? I, I've seen no evidence in my research, which doesn't mean there isn't any. By him, by anyone related to Hitler in terms of his inner circle, who suggested it was planned uh, because it was Valpurgis Night. Nor was Hitler one of the more devoted occultists. That is, he he was interested in the supernatural imaginary, but he didn't have any particular doctrine he followed. Right. Mm. So he thought werewolves were cool. So he would name his his hideout werewolf. Right. His Ukrainian. Uh, it was called the werewolf. And when Himmler's like, why don't we call these partisans werewolves? They're like, yeah, that's awesome. Let's call them were- werewolves. <laughs> so, you know, Hitler was more of a kind of amateur, what do you want to call it, esotericist or paganist, who could just as easily, if he needed to impress a crowd, say something about Christians or socialism. Um, so I don't think that he would have planned that. Now, who knows? And Goebbels also was kind of uh, agnostic. Um, we do know, though, that he wanted Speer to he wanted to to watch Wagner's Ring Cycle, including the final one, Gotter Damerung, um, shortly before his birthday, when he was already contemplating suicide. And hmm. Speer remarks on that in his in his memoirs. How it's fitting, you know, that Hitler wanted to do this because he thought in these you know these mythological um, Ragnarokian terms about everything. So in this broader sense of just epistemology of how he approached the world, Hitler was clearly thinking in, in an end of times Nordic way about what was happening, but I don't think he planned it based on Valpurgis night. Uh, that's interesting. Well, Dr. Kurlinder, thanks for being on the show. Uh, people, the book is called Hitler's Monsters, a supernatural history of the third Reich. You can get it on Amazon, I'm assuming. I think that's the easiest, that's and the easiest. Uh, it's in many major booksellers as well, Barnes and Noble and stuff like that. All right, I mean I've, you can at least order it. Definitely have to check it out. Thank, thank you for taking the time to chat with us. Thank you, Dee. It's been fun. All right, thanks. Take care.